We're going to be studying Hebrews, such an incredible passage and, and book. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and find Hebrews 3. I was in seminary, and uh, boy, I had a professor that I fell in love with right away. He was my systematic theology professor. His name was Roger Nicole. I've referenced him on different occasions since I've been here. Dr. Nicole was German. He grew up in Switzerland. He eventually moved to France and immigrated to America with his family from France. His dad was a noted theologian and scholar, and, and uh, boy, they had done quite a bit of work and research on the Bible. And when you heard him teach, you knew he was on a different plane. And so here I am, a young seminary student, and I want to become like Dr. Nicole. And I ask him, uh, how can I, uh, first of all, get an A in this class? Because I want an A in theology, and I love theology, and I love you. And uh, then he said something to me in that German brogue that I barely understood. But he said, I'll bring you some books for you to review. I need to review some books, and you can do those for me, and that'll be extra credit. I thought, this is great. I'm getting in good with Dr. Nicole. I came to class the next week. I walked in, and there was his desk, and there were a stack of books that were literally about that high. And I thought, wow, wonder what he's going to do with those books. Mr. Yurka, I brought these for you to review. That was on top of what we had to do, that the syllabus required, what my other classes required, not let alone ministry required, and home life required. And I thought, why did I ask for this? But once you're committed, well, it was pride more than anything. I took that home, and I realized right away, not only did he give me books to read, but he gave me German books to read and books from Catholic theologians that he wanted me to refute. And when I say that there are books that you have to read a line over and over again to understand it, that was what it was like. And uh, I, I just, I don't know why I'm telling that story other than just be careful what you ask for. But really, if you do want to excel in knowing Christ, uh, it's hard work. You came here on a Wednesday, and I always commend every person that comes on Wednesday because it's the middle of the week, and there are a lot of things fighting for your attention and um, your time. And uh, you came tonight, and I just want to say I I'm grateful. When I pulled into the parking lot, and there's cars in the parking lot, I said, Lord, thank you that there are men and women who love you and love your word and are committed. It's not always easy. As we go through the book of Hebrews, sometimes it's going, to be, it's going to be really easy. I mean, we're going to get it right away. We're going to grab a hold of it. We're going to take it and run with it. And there are other times we have to apply ourselves a little bit to the message. I understand on a Wednesday night, um, that can be a challenge, not because you're not the most bright uh, people I know, but because, uh, and you are, um, it's not because of that. It's because it's Wednesday and it's nighttime. So I'm going to dive into some deep, deep material here, but I hope, uh, by God's grace, to help us to grab a hold of it and run with it, okay? Y'all going to help me? Good, all right. So let's look at this Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. It says very simply, therefore, holy brothers, verse 1, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Have you ever considered that Jesus is the apostle? When you think of apostle, you might not first think about Jesus. But the writer of Hebrews describes him that way, an apostle. Gives him that title, that office. But not only that, a high priest, and not only a high priest, chapter 2 tells us the faithful high priest or the great high priest, and he's the high priest of our confession. So this is more than something that we know, more than something that we must grasp or get. It's something that we need to confess or agree with. And you cannot confess and agree with something that you're not sure what it means. What am I agreeing to? What am I signing up for? What did I ask for? So I want us to jump into this. There was a story I heard some time ago, and I love this story. It was 
about a man who died in the Second World War. He was a British officer, a wealthy man, and he had one son. And that son, excuse me, I, 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 I should say to you that that son had died in, in the, war, uh, the Second World War. This wealthy man had uh, also died, and uh, he had a will. His family members showed up to hear the reading of the will. The reason they were so interested is obviously he was wealthy, but more than that, he had an incredible painting collection that was worth a lot of money. And some of those paintings were priceless. And there was one painting that was in the center of all the art on the tripod set up right in front of where the lawyer there would read that will. And uh, as that lawyer came in to read the will, he unveiled the painting, and the painting on the tripod was one painting that the wealthy man himself had painted. He painted a, a portrait of his son. It was, to a lot of people, you know, not worth a whole lot. And so the will said, we're going to start before reading the will with an auction. Uh, the, the, the man who is bequeathed everything wanted first there to be an auction, and we're going to auction off this painting. It's the painting of his son. And uh, everyone who was there really was interested in so much more than that painting. And so not much was bid. So finally, someone kind of just raised their hand, put a, a bid on the painting and won the painting. And then the will was read. I didn't tell you why we started with this auction because I was given that instruction by this particular wealthy man. But I wanted you to know what the will said. The will says, whoever gets this painting gets all the paintings. And then the lawyer said, whoever gets the sun gets it all. You can kind of see the point that the writer of Hebrews is saying in the same way, whoever gets Jesus gets it all. Don't shrink back from Jesus. The problem that was being dealt with in the Hebrew congregation was that there were people who had not grabbed hold of Jesus yet. They liked the idea of the new covenant, the promise in Jesus Christ, but they were reluctant to let go of their old covenant lifestyles that included tangible traditions. But those tangible traditions were made real and full in the one who is the apostle and the faithful high priest. And the writer is saying to these people, don't shrink back from Christ. Don't go back to your ritual religions, but hold on to Jesus Christ. In fact, if you get Jesus, you get all of that. Everything you've hoped for in the past, including the kingdom of God and the city built with hands that are not man's but God, that city belongs to those who get the Son. If you get Jesus, you get it all. Same for us tonight. And I want us to think about it in these terms because we're here on a Wednesday night in 2024 about to celebrate Easter. Come on, y'all. He is risen. He's risen indeed. And we're like, okay, but we've already grabbed hold of Jesus. What is this mean for us? And that's a good question. I think we should always ask that question. What does this mean? And then how should I then apply it? What does it mean? That's more important than what it means for me. But I need to know then, after I understand what it means, what does it mean for me? What it means for us is this, that if you get Jesus, you get it all. And therefore, if you lose everything but have Jesus, you've lost nothing. And the, beyond that, uh, Jesus who is better than everything is really better than everything that we could ever imagine. Today, we, we measure things. You can go to some stores, and they'll have, on occasion, uh, good, better, best. So what do I need here? I don't, wanna, I don't need the best because I don't need to spend a lot of money. I just need good uh, or maybe better. But you know what? Sometimes you splurge and get the best. The way we measure things mostly today is how many stars does it get? There are those of you who won't go to our restaurant that doesn't have at least four and a half stars. You're going to measure things by what is best. 
Well, Jesus is way beyond anything that we could measure him by. There's no comparison to Jesus, but the writer of Hebrews is going to try to help us to understand how superfluous, how superior he is to everything else. That superfluous was not the right word. Superior is what I meant to say. Superior to everything else. So everything then should be measured by Jesus. Everything should be measured by Jesus. He starts with telling us that the prophets in chapter 1 were great, wonderful prophets, but we have a better spokesperson. God has now spoken through his son who is a greater speaker, a greater communicator, therefore superior to the prophets. They're great prophets. And then we don't really grab hold of this a whole lot like the people in the first century. We don't really understand exactly everything that was going on in the first century with angel worship, but it seems that there was an inordinate affection towards angels by the Hebrews in the first century. Paul told told the Colossians, be careful that you don't get swept away by people who worship angels. So people must have actually worshiped angels. But if you had that kind of love for angels and you paid a lot of attention to what you thought were angels, you needed to know that Jesus was better than the angels. Don't worship angels. Don't give your affection to them and don't be inordinately curious about them. Jesus is far better than the angels. And now, now we come to chapter 3 and there's this transition where the writer of Hebrews says, and Jesus is better than Moses. Now, for the first century Jew, that would have been, that would have been an amazing statement because Abraham of course, was their father and held in the highest esteem. So was King David and then Moses. But the writer of Hebrews is going to tell us that Jesus is better than Moses. Now, Moses had an incredible birth and salvation, but Jesus had a more incredible birth and salvation. Both of them saved going into Egypt. Moses was an incredible deliverer. Jesus, a greater deliverer. Moses was a statesman. Jesus was the Word of God. Moses was a leader. Jesus is the consummate leader. We talked about the fact last week, he's the captain of our salvation, which means he's out in front leading, removing all obstacles for us to move on with him. He is the great apostle. Did you know Moses was also an apostle? When you think about apostles, They are those who are sent by God. In the Old Testament, an apostle was distinct from the New Testament apostles, but same in this sense, distinct in this sense that the New Testament apostles witnessed the resurrected Christ. By the way, if anyone says that they're an apostle, they're not. Because apostles who held that office had seen the resurrected Christ, right? Paul saw the resurrected Christ, but saw him at a different time. He said, I'm an apostle born out of due time. The Old Testament apostles, but were similar in this sense, they were sent by God. The New Testament apostles were sent by God for the church. The Old Testament sent for Christ. Moses was a sent spokesman by God. And Jesus is the greater apostle. Moses, on occasion, mediated for the people of God. He came in between God's people who were complaining and murmuring, people who had everything but murmured against God. And and God said, you know what? I'm going to start over. You probably would have never felt that way, but Moses would say, but no, God, for your namesake. It wasn't that God would change his mind. He was just showing through Moses that there needed to be a mediator between God and man, and there would be a greater mediator to come, the only one who could actually mediate between sinful man and holy God is the man Christ Jesus. Moses was a lawgiver. Jesus was not only the law, he was the embodiment of it, and he fulfilled it completely. Uh, I could keep going about Moses and Jesus. But in the end, Moses faltered. Probably some of the saddest scripture you'll read is when Moses is angered and in the flesh strikes a rock twice and is unable to lead the people of God into the promised land. He was faithful. 
a faithful servant of God, but he failed. However, our Lord Jesus never stumbled. He never failed. So, a little bit of introduction. Let's stand and let's read this text, and I'll walk us right through it. If you don't mind standing, and we'll read verse 1 through verse 6. Therefore, holy brothers, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Thank you for standing. This is God's word. You may be seated. Now, I want you to think about, we've talked about some special themes. We've talked about the themes that taught us so far Jesus is superior to prophets, to angels, and to Moses. There are some special terms to recognize. Notice that we have here this conversation. You are holy brothers, brothers. Why, and why would we even be called brothers, those of us who are in the household of God? Well, if you were to go back to the previous chapter, you would read in the last verses that Jesus became, like us in every way, a brother, a brother. Jesus did not only assume human flesh. He did not come to look like God. In fact, Jesus came not to reflect God or to show us what God was like. Jesus did not come to show us what God was like, but to show us God. And yet, at the same time, showing us God because He is God became like us in every respect. I mean, He entered into our environment. He embodied our, our own flesh. He, he knows everything that we go through. There's not one thing that all the billions who live on this earth have gone through that Jesus didn't go through, but He went through without sin. That way, He could be a brother to us and call us into a brotherhood. But not just any brotherhood. Notice this, a holy brotherhood brotherhood. A holy brotherhood has the idea of what we are, and we're not holy brothers because we live or behave in a certain way. We should. We should live and behave in a certain way. I mean, Peter said we ought to be holy just as we are holy, and he meant the same thing as this writer. Because we are holy, that should affect our behavior and not vice versa. Religion says be holy so you can get holy, the, the gospel says God makes you holy. You can't ever get holy until he makes you holy. And since he makes you holy, then live holy, and you're a holy brother. This is why Jesus is the faithful high priest, because Jesus came to present God to us. That's what a high priest did in the Old Testament. He presented God to the people. And Jesus came not only to present God, but to be the presentation of God in flesh. And high priest presented God to the people, but also presented people to God by taking a sacrifice into the temple to atone for the sins of the people. He presented the people to God. God's holy, men sinful, there need to be a mediator, the high priest was there. Jesus, in a greater way, is our faithful high priest who presents sinful man to a holy God because he himself is the sacrifice. We're going to see what that means more particularly in the middle parts of this book of Hebrews. But here's what next happens, another special term. We're going to see that we're the house or the people of God all the way through the Bible, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. You begin to see how God is building a people that he might dwell in, a people that he might dwell in, here termed as the house of God. So this is a special, special passage because it has special themes, it has special terms, it's a special text. Hebrews, this is so good about it. We're still kind of in the beginning of Hebrews here, kind of wading into it. Hebrews is so special because if you didn't have an Old Testament, if all you had was a Gideon New Testament, and you lived on some island where you couldn't get an Old Testament, and they didn't have internet reception, oh, that would be terrible. 
If all you had was your New Testament and you got to the book of Hebrews, you could pretty much figure out what the Old Testament was about even though you never read the Old Testament. Pretty amazing. Because in the the book of Hebrews, you see how that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, which was God's promise to the Israelites that required them to keep a law, but showed them they could not keep the law, that they needed someone to come keep it for them, and that they needed a sacrifice, they needed a sacrifice for their sin because they could never atone for their sin, so they needed a perfect sacrifice that would take away their sin once and for all, all pointed to Christ who was coming in the New Covenant, the New Testament. We read here that Jesus then, look with me again, is our great apostle. He is a great apostle. And he is the priest of our confession. Now, very important to understand some terms here that Jesus, again, is our great apostle. As we consider Jesus, we should consider everything by him and consider the fact that as he is the great apostle, he, like Moses, has been sent. And every apostle was sent from somewhere and from someone and to someone. Moses was sent by God from a wilderness to people in bondage. Our greater Moses, Jesus, was sent from heaven by God the Father to sinful men. So he is the apostle. When we're told here to consider Jesus, we're told to consider Jesus. We're not told to consider Jesus in this way. We might think, I do need to consider Jesus. Some people do consider Jesus. This week, many people will be considering Jesus. They'll be thinking about Jesus. They're they're having thoughts about Jesus. The writer of Hebrews is not telling us to contemplate Jesus but to contemplate everything else by Jesus. Okay, what does that mean? Well, let's think about it and what it meant, because then we can get to what it means. Think about everything in the Old Testament by Jesus. Okay, let's think about the temple. What was the temple about? Uh, We could go in in a lot of detail tonight, but let's just think about it in, in kind of grand themes. The temple represented the presence of God, didn't it? Everywhere the temple was, the Israelites knew God's glory rested there. It was a reminder of the presence of God. Let's think about the temple by considering Christ. The the temple that that showed or demonstrated the presence of God and, and really was a place where God's glory dwelled, in light of Christ shows us that the temple was inferior to the one who would come and is the glory of God. John said what? We beheld him, right? I love 1 John. Like we touched him, we held him. But he also tells us, and we beheld the very glory of God. Think about the sacrificial system, and I don't have to take you very far here. You look at all these sacrifices and these lambs that were slain, and you remember John the Baptist's words about Jesus, right? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We measure or we consider all those sacrifices by Jesus Christ. I could go on and on tonight. I'm with you on a Wednesday night crowd. If you're new to the Bible, I want you to realize how special the Bible is. There are over 63,000 thousand cross-references in the Bible. The Bible is an amazing book that rests upon itself. Nowhere does it contradict itself. It is one consistent theme that we need a Redeemer, that we need a Savior, and everything that happened in the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, we measure everything in the Old Testament by Jesus Christ. Skipping ahead, skipping ahead, and and how how do we apply this to our lives today? that we should measure everything in this world that we go through, we experience, that we learn, that we see, that we hear, that is tangible to us or intangible by Jesus Christ. Now, you can work that out so many ways. How do you measure your children by Jesus Christ, your family by Jesus Christ, your possessions by Jesus Christ? How do you measure what all that's going on in this world means? There's so much that's going on in this world that can cause us trouble. Or we can measure everything that's going on in this world by Jesus Christ and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
everything that's going on in this world, if I think about why it's going on in this world by Jesus Christ, then it has a meaning. There's a purpose for suffering. There's a purpose for sickness. There's a purpose for all that we're struggling in this world with because by Jesus Christ, I can make sense of the suffering that cannot compare to the weight of glory that is to come and what he's doing in my life. We measure everything by Jesus Christ. How do I, do, how do I begin doing that? Well, think about this and in this way. We must consider Jesus in light of Scripture. If we're going to consider Jesus, then we have to see Jesus everywhere in Scripture and recognize where he is and how do we apply these Scriptures to our lives so we might glorify him. But I want us to look back in this text and consider Moses for a moment. But consider Moses in the light of Christ. Look in, at the end of verse 2. Just as Moses was a faithful in all God's house, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Now again, Abraham was so special because God promises were given to Abraham, but those promises that all the world would be blessed by his seed were realized in Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, and everyone who has faith in Jesus Christ is a child of Abraham and is blessed through Jesus Christ. But Moses was their lawgiver, and Jesus was not only the son of promise, Jesus was the fulfillment of the law, but he was more than that, the embodiment of the law. I've talked about special themes, terms, and the text, but I want you to see the special teaching, verse 4. As the writer says, now every house is built by someone. Everybody say, amen, I get that one. I don't, you don't have to explain that one, Pastor. I got it. But the builder of all things is God. I got that too. Pretty simple. If there's a house, somebody build it. Amen. amen. You don't hear a lot these days about um, uh, the, theistic evolution. I'm glad. But you still hear the thought that we are product of naturalistic evolution as if everything got here by chance. And nobody drives through a neighborhood and says, check that house out. Wonder how long it took that house to evolve. Now you're like, who built that house? And, you know, like how many stars did they have <laughs> on Google review? How, what quality is that house? Based on the quality of the builder. I mean, if you, right, this is simple. And this is what the writer is saying. No house has been built except by God. And therefore, Moses, <laughs> as great as he was, he's made by God. And he's a member of the house. But there's a maker of that house. And one reason Jesus is greater than the house, and we've already seen some, is that he's the maker of the house. We're going to see in chapter 11, he created all things out of nothing. And so then in verse 5, you have, now Moses was faithful as a servant, and praise God, he was a servant. The word there literally is the word slave. Oftentimes, in um, just about every time except for this one time, in the Greek New Testament, servant is translated from the word doulos, which is slave. But here, it's a different word, and this word has to do with, with being a, a chosen servant. It's not slave. It's the only place it's not to be translated slave. So the word servant there is right. And Moses was faithful as a chosen servant. And why was he chosen? To speak about things that would come later. What things would come later? Remember when Jesus rose from the dead and he's on the way uh, with a group of guys, a couple guys, you know, they're, they're on the road back to Emmaus and then he goes into their house and he begins, Jesus begins to teach them beginning with Moses and the prophets. What Jesus did there is what the writer of Hebrews is doing here, telling us Moses, though he was a prophet of God and an apostle sent by God, was speaking about the one who would come later, the greater Moses. Verse 6, but Christ is faithful over the house as a son. Where Moses was a servant, Jesus is the son. There is a full-bodied objectivity to this confession that we need to make here. It is Christ is faithful over the house as a son, and we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and boasting and hope. In other words, in other words, it is because Jesus has fulfilled the promises of God 
has lived out the law perfectly, he has proven he's not just a servant of God. In fact, he's the son of God. No servant inherits a house. The son inherits the house. And y'all, who's the house? I guess I could ask what's the house, but that would be the wrong question because if you follow the, the biblical teaching from the beginning of the Bible to the end, you will know that the house is not brick and stick. It is people. Who inherits people? It's not Moses. It's Christ who will indwell the people of God. He is then, therefore, our Savior and our hope, and we must confess Him as our only hope. And by confessing Him, know that He dwells in us. John Newton um, I was asked by a lady for some help. She needed physical healing. She needed spiritual healing. It was her soul. It was her body. And here's what he said to her. John Newton said this. You don't know who John Newton is. He's the author of Amazing Grace. Great story. Wonderful biographies about him. He said to this lady, ponder a crucified, risen, reigning redeemer, madam, and there will be more for your soul, body, and mind than doctors can prescribe. Ponder the glories of a crucified, risen, and reigning redeemer. I I feel confident that this is exactly what the writer of Hebrews is telling these vacillating, worrisome Jews who were hearing about Christ but not measuring everything by Christ and not embracing Christ as their Savior. The problem that you're going to find in Hebrews is that there are some Jews who are not converted and they shrink back, they go back to their old lifestyle of Judaism or Judaistic style religion and, and, and the writer of Hebrews, don't, 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 don't stop short, don't stop short. Measure all of that by Christ. All of that points to Christ. Consider, ponder Christ. Do you remember where he says, consider Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He went to the cross for you. He suffered for you. It's not just to think about him. It's to embrace him and confess him as Lord. We we rush around a lot. And we have to move from here to there. But I think it's very important for us, especially even a week like this, given that it's Passion Week, that we consider Christ. The crucified, risen, reigning Redeemer. That he's our crucified, risen, reigning Redeemer. He's mine. I have him, and he has me. And because of that, I'm his house. He dwells in me. He dwells in you. I think it's real important that we think about him that way. The the late Dr. Criswell, the the great pastor at First Baptist Dallas, Texas, said, to compare greatest men on earth like Alexander or Caesar or Shakespeare with Jesus is like comparing a grain of dust to the whole universe or like comparing a molehill to Mount Everest in the Himalayas. I think that gets at the heart of the text. We ought to consider Jesus by measuring everything by Jesus because there is nothing that compares to Jesus. And we have him, and he has us. There are some in the book of Hebrews who shrink away because they're not converted. There are others who were, but they were vacillating. And it's there, too, that the writer is saying, don't, don't. He's so much better than all of life. I think it would be good for us right now Uh, to just bow our heads and meditate for a moment on our crucified, our risen, and our reigning Christ. And thank God that he's made us a part of his kingdom. We, We are his house. And not only are we his house, so are all the Old Testament saints. All those who are looking forward, looking forward to the Messiah are the house of God. We too have been included in this house of God, and he dwells in us. And would you thank God that he not only came out of the grave, but he came into your heart. He came to dwell in you, and right now, you have him. And I'm going to tell you, I think doing this will help us with whatever else might be plaguing our mind tonight as we consider or measure those things next to Christ.
And Lord, it's just a, an incredible reminder tonight from your word that really nothing makes sense without Christ. And with you, all the pieces of the puzzle fall into place. And so may we, like Paul reminded us and encouraged us and exhorted us to do, run for the prize, to, to grab hold of Christ, to know you in the power of your, your, your crucifixion and the power of the resurrection, to know you, Lord, so that we, we do measure everything by you. Lord, everything to be brought into obedience to you, every imagination and thought and argument, to measure all philosophies, all ideas by you, measure all possessions and all our experiences by you, to measure all our ambitions and dreams by you, God, that Christ would be all in us. He's superior to everything, to every experience, every feeling, every thought. And so, Father, may Jesus be all in us it is what you're attempting, and, and, and because you're attempting, you will be successful in us to make us like Christ. It will be exactly what we'll realize when we're in your presence. We'll be just like Christ. And so, Lord, may uh, we just submit to your will and be more like Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.